Do you know what animal I always thought would make a great superhero? A sloth! Because they're super slow. Here's how I draw one. I think I'd start a super sloth by drawing its head. A sloth has a very wide kind of oval face. So I'm gonna draw that first. And then inside of the oval, I'm gonna put two beady eyes. Look at these black beady eyes. And then around the outside of the eyes, I'm gonna trace a line because a sloth has a different colored, uh, different colored fur around their eyes to the rest of their face. And it's kind of cool because if you draw a line around there, it kind of looks like a mask. And a lot of superheroes, they have masks. It makes sense. So I've done that. And now I can pop the nose into place. Just a little triangle underneath the eyes. And now that the nose is in place, I can put in the smile. Sloths have a big, wide, happy mouth. I mean, if they're happy sloths. And now I can outline the face because the sloth's fur, again, changes colour and it gives it kind of this mask look. Oh, don't forget the eyebrows. There we go. So that we know how our super sloth is feeling, I'm just going to pop a line in here that follows the outline of the face because that's where the sloth's costume is going to begin. Now, sloths they don't really have necks so much. So we're gonna get straight in to the arms. I'm gonna have them pointing out like this, kind of like a triangle and pointing back in. And uh, I'm gonna put some claws in. <laughs> claws for hanging on to tall buildings uh, when you're being super. And I'll pop in another one on the other side. And now we have two arms on the sloth's hips. Striking a power pose. All right, so now we're gonna start on the body and I'm just really gonna draw a straight line from where the underarms are down the page. It's gonna slightly angle out just like that. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here. And now in between those two lines, I'm gonna draw kind of like a curved triangle, just like this. And now the sloth has two legs, two sloth legs for running after villains, or walking, or crawling very slowly. I'm gonna pop in two feet now. They're like rectangles. And they're gonna have some claws at the end of them too. Nice claws, not mean claws. It's a superhero, not a supervillain. And finally, how about um, superheroes? They didn't really get the memo that you're supposed to wear your underwear underneath your clothes. So she's gonna have some underwear on the outside of her costume. Silly super sloth. <laughs> and I'm gonna give her her name on her, um, on her costume, SS for super sloth. And an awesome lightning bolt, just to remind us how not speedy she is. I think there's something missing from this. You know what I think it is? It's a cape. Every superhero has one. So I'm just gonna draw a line all the way out here and then curve it back under so that she's got her superhero cape billowing in the breeze and she'll probably be there for quite a lot longer because she's slow. And there you have it, a super slob. Um, cartoony, kind of. It looks very like cartoon. It's different. Do you know what animal I always thought would make a great superhero? A sloth, because they're super slow. It's like a dog or something in like a Superman suit. Looks like a bear. I think the animal's a meerkat. A mix between a monkey and a dog. And now the sloth has two legs for running after villains. I don't think there's a meaning, but I think it's like it kind of looks like it's a part of a cartoon, like a story or something. Super dog. Superhero. And there you
there you have it, a super slot. I would like make the buildings a bit bigger and maybe make the moon a bit bigger and the clouds a little bit smaller. Um, maybe add some colour to it. I just really like it, I don't know what to say. Hi, I'm Jai, I'm 16 and live in Tasmania. I love making things. One of the biggest memories of my first craft and sewing was that my nan brought a kid's sewing machine and I made clothes for my sister's doll. I get inspired all the time and have all these ideas in my head. The weirdest thing I've ever made is a suit made out of onions and they were really smelly but looked great. <laughs> Are you one of those people who love wearing jewellery but can never find the colour or style you like? Well, today I'm going to show you how to make your very own. Here's what you'll need. Polymer clay in a variety of colours, cotton cord, a toothpick, a pair of scissors, gloves and an oven. But that comes later. So the first step is to put on those gloves. My beads are going to be quite big, so I'm going to use a whole quarter of this clay. Now we're going to stretch out the clay to make it warm in our hands, ready for us to roll the ball. Now we can start rolling the clay in our hands. So just put the clay on the top of your palm and start rolling. The reason I'm wearing gloves is so that I don't get any fingerprints on my clay. So I have a nice smooth edge. I've chosen four different colours, but you can choose any colours you like. Keep rolling until you've got a nice finish. This could take a few minutes. Okay, I'm happy with that shape. Now grab your skewer and place it through carefully. You really want to go slowly and make sure that you go through the centre of the bowl. Okay, let's sit that aside. Now there's lots of different shapes you can make. The next one I'm going to show you is a square. Now I've taken off a quarter and with my skewer, I'm going to cut it just like that. Now what we want to do is just smooth out the edges. I'm just pressing down on each side, making it nice and smooth. And again, we're just placing your skewer through the middle of the bead very carefully. Now we're going to mix two colours to create one bead. Take half a portion of the pink and take half a portion of the blue, place them together and twist. Be careful when rolling. We don't want to completely roll both colours together. We want to see some streaks of each colour. And once again, skewer through the middle. Be careful and make sure you're going through the middle. All done. We can place that one aside. These are just a few shapes. I've made many more before, like flat oval, hexagons, they're a little tricky, triangles, diamonds. There's so many shapes you can make. Okay, these are ready. Time to put them in the oven. I've baked my beads as per the instructions on the packet. And as you can see, some of them didn't quite make it. This one here, I wasn't wearing gloves, so it's got a few fingerprints in it. This one here, I overbaked, so it's got some cracks in it. However, I did find four perfect ones and I've threaded them onto some cotton cord. Now you can use ribbon, leather, it's totally up to you. As long as you measure out how long you want your beads to hang down. Once you're happy, you just have to tie up the top. Cut off the excess cord. Okay. Now they're ready to wear.
Uh, the weirdest thing I've ever made is a really hard question because I have made so much weird stuff. I've made a lot of weird things. <laughs> the weirdest thing. Okay, so I made this massive gloopy ball. I got a can of alphabet soup, poured in some glue, mixed it up, and then poured it out into a canvas and arranged letters to make a bit of a text. It was cool for a while until the tomato sauce got a bit stinky. Bunched it all together in this mushy, monstrous sort of thing that kind of looked like bubble gum. Like, I'm sure I've definitely made some weird things as a kid. Like, I think I made, you know, a guitar out of a cereal box and it didn't make any noise, but that's pretty weird. I don't know. An animation using a chippy packet. <laughs> and it kind of grew and then it sucked back in and it was, yeah, it was just strange. <laughs> and then I poured all different types of paint over it and then sprinkled it with glitter and dust and stars. The weirdest is probably a giant whale, like a life-size blue whale made out of calico and foam and timber. That was not very easy to clean off. Seven of the people in my uni class and I had to get inside the whale and make it operate in front of so many people. It was, <laughs> it was so ridiculous. I was doing a big canvas covered in different coloured paints and I was throwing all this stuff off and I actually started to step on the canvas and like jump around on it. And someone was filming me at the time because it was going to be a multimodal piece, but I accidentally just fully slipped over in the paint and fell backwards and I was just a big skid mark all through the paint. <laughs> the weirdest thing I've ever made is a suit made out of naturally dyed onions. So I boiled the onions for 10 hours and then dyed the clothes and they were really smelly but looked great. It turned into this crazy kaleidoscopic thing, um, this like monument that just wasn't worth much, but I think it was spectacular for the colour. Maybe one of the weirdest things I've ever made is a short film about a girl who decides to turn into a painting. But not until after she's turned into a lamb and a few other strange, I can't even remember, but it was strange. It was really weird. <laughs> it's like a clay thing. Yeah. <laughs> Great to take photographs of big things, but it is also wonderful to take photographs of small things. Not that these guys are very small. This is a spiny leaf insect, and this magnificent creature is a goliath stick insect. Let me just turn him around to the camera. So he's looking, see him feeling his way there? So, if you want to get a really powerful image of one of these, it is great to have what they call a macro lens. So that will enable you to be really close and get a shot of his eyes or his antenna. If you can get in this close with one of these guys, you're gonna have a wildlife photograph of the year. So I'm lucky here, this is a really wide angle lens. I happened to bring by accident. But that means that I can get right in close. That's given me, just like that, a really fantastic shot. your photography. It's great to kind of step back and get a nice wide shot of all of him, showing all his three and a half metres. But then, when you have an opportunity like this, we're in a controlled environment, it's great to get right in close and get... Look at that. 
get a shot of this dinosaur. How incredible. Look at the patterns on his skin. The great thing about this is the opportunity to see this absolute super predator so close. Look at this ancient beast as he slides back down. We're probably a little bit too close for comfort. That flight or fight zone, well, we've gotten a little bit too close and he said, enough already. I've given you some nice photographs. I'm gonna go back and retreat to where I feel much more comfortable and much more safe. <laughs> How is that yawn? Now, there are fast-moving animals in this world, and then there are slow-moving animals, like the sloth and like our very own sleepy, sleepy koala. You're never going to have trouble photographing one of these guys. You will in the wild, because often they'll be way up in the top of sort of 20 and 30 metre trees. A really important point about photographing any animal is also to get it in its environment, to see it in its natural environment. So not everything has to be a close-up of the lion's head or the kangaroo's head or the koala's head here. It's nice to get back, step back a little bit, and we can see the eucalyptus. We can see how he positions himself very comfortably to just smooth the days away. And also, when we do come in close, we can see just how sharp those claws are. You wonder how this creature can get up a tree so quickly. You see those big claws that can hook around the branches and the, the trunk of a gum tree and lift himself up really quickly. Isn't he beautiful? I think it's time to let sleeping koalas lie. Hi. Should I say hi? Said hi. <laughs> I'm Arthur Adams, and I'm a comic book artist. I, I really should be paid for erasing more than drawing, because that is the main thing I do. I'm often quite frustrated with my drawings. I'm trying to get the characters to act, and often when I'll, I'll do a drawing, I'll say, well, this is fine, but I believe I can make it better. I don't have a carpet in my studio. It's just a pile of erasures. Um, that's not really true, but uh, um, but I do erase a great deal. I, I erase probably more than I draw. What I've often thought is that everyone can draw, but somewhere along the line, people get either convinced by someone else, or, or sometimes people convince themselves that they can't draw. My little girl, she's in she's in kindergarten now, and all of the kids draw. They absolutely all of them draw, and for the most part, they're awful. But they're all very happy doing it, right? I like to, to work in my studio. Some people like uh, I know people who like to work in uh, restaurants or in parks. But for me, I like to work in my studio where I'm surrounded by my books and my comic books. And if you were to talk to my wife, she would tell you that I have a small collection of toys, which I find helpful for my work. <laughs> what I always try to do in my stories is make sure that I draw very clearly. The face is always the most important, followed closely by hands. When I'm drawing a comic book, I'm telling a story, so that's, I'm making all of the characters act, basically. So I can't just draw them stiff, because that would get really boring really fast. What I hope to convey in my drawings of heroes is that they have a sense of hope to them, even in the face of uh, danger or something that could be frightening in the story. But I always want them to be hopeful and hopefully of good cheer. Oh, I've always liked green, but that's often used as a as a villain color, uh, unless it's the well. Marvel kind of broke some of that because they had the Hulk and and the thing was an orange. Because usually it's the, the primary colors are the superheroes. Generally, not always, but especially in the old days, mostly primary colors for the superheroes, and secondary colors for the villains. So that's we know for someone's purple and orange or purple and green, we know they're bad. What I always try to remember when I'm drawing villains is that from the villain's point of view. They're the good guy. They don't know they're a villain. 
they, they're just confused, right? <laughs> so I try to sometimes, often I try to have my villains, again, try to have a sense of humor because they think they're the star of the show. They don't know that they're bad. <laughs> I, I like to use up lighting or very strong lighting when I'm drawing a villain. Adds harsher lines to the character's faces. Often I will be working on a project that I started the day before because it's easier to work on a piece of paper that's already got lines on. It's, it's sometimes a blank piece of paper could be quite frustrating. And one of my favorite things about my job is that I get to wear my pajamas all day long. <laughs> my name is Arthur Adams and I am a comic book artist.